In 2018, I traveled to England to research the mysterious rare disease that I've had since birth. My first stop, Queen Square, London. This is where the story of Wilson disease began. It was here at the National Hospital for Neurology that Samuel Alexander Kinnear Wilson made a landmark discovery. In 1912, the American-born British-trained physician identified an illness with an unlikely combination of characteristics, changes in the brain, and cirrhosis of the liver. The disease was always fatal in the young patients he observed. He called it progressive lenticular degeneration. Dr. Wilson's son, James Kinnear Wilson, lives nearby in Cambridge and remembers his father's discovery and when hepato, or liver, was added to the name. It's been called hepatolenticular disease. But I don't think he would have liked that because hepas is Greek and lenticularis is Latin and uh, he was a classical scholar and I'm sure he would have said they don't mix. <laughs> After Dr. Wilson published his finding, it was given a new name, Wilson disease. I think he was very pleased about it. <laughs> very proud of it. Yes, yes, it's quite an honor. He um, presented the thesis to Edinburgh University and uh, received a gold medal as a result of it. Despite Dr. Wilson's continuing research, discovering the cause of the disease eluded him. He didn't know what caused it. He got as far as saying that it was toxic in origin. Dr. Wilson was right. Doctors discovered decades later that a genetic defect allows copper, an essential dietary mineral, to accumulate in the liver and brain, causing a variety of devastating symptoms as can be seen in this film from the 1980s. This liver disease may cause swelling of the abdomen, jaundice, bleeding, as relentlessly worsening tremors or rigidity of the hands, feet, and head, drooling and slurring of speech, and abrupt personality change, the sudden appearance of impulsive, grossly inappropriate behavior, often sexual in nature, temper tantrums, inexplicable deterioration of schoolwork, or the appearance of a psychosis that cannot be distinguished from schizophrenia or manic depression. Everybody with a diagnosis of Wilson disease is different. And from what I've seen of the Wilson disease patients, it is absolutely true. They're all different. In my case, Wilson disease put me in liver failure when I was a college student. I was lucky. I was diagnosed. By then there was a treatment and it worked. I've had a normal life and spent my career reporting medical news. I've been living with a diagnosis for 35 years and trying to understand it better. I found out that Dr. John Walsh discovered the first treatment for Wilson disease. He's 98 years old and also lives in Cambridge. So when was the first time you heard about Wilson disease? I had a, a Fulbright Fellowship to the States, 54, 55. I was working with Charlie Davidson, who was a liver doctor. And we were asked to see a Wilson disease patient who'd gone into liver failure. They couldn't help the patient then, but crossing the bridge from Boston City Hospital back to Thorndike Laboratory, Dr. Walsh had what he calls an inspiration. I said to Charlie Davidson, you know, what this chap really wants is penicillamine. And Charlie Davis said, what's that? I discovered this new amino acid which had never been seen in human urine before. Dr. Walsh had previously discovered penicillamine in London during the early 1950s while studying lab samples from people who were given the antibiotic penicillin. And then it was just put in the memory bank as an interesting observation of no particular importance. To prove his theory, a chemist from MIT then provided Dr. Walsh with some penicillamine, and then he did what would be unheard of today. He tried it on himself first. But it didn't do me any harm, and the next day I was alive and well, so I decided it was safe for me, it was safe for the patient. So what happened then when you tried it on the patients in well, Boston? Well, got copper out. 
Soon after, Dr. Walsh's Boston Fellowship was over, so he returned to London with a small supply of penicillin and tried it on some patients. My father was Britain's leading neurologist at the time, and he found some Wilson's disease patients for me to try it out on. One of them was Shirley Wiley. It's a medical marvel that she can draw this spiral. In 1955, she was facing almost certain death until a series of remarkable coincidences brought Dr. John Walsh to her bedside. What did she look like when you first met Shirley? A mess, a mess. She was bedridden and helpless. Shirley was 15 when she was taken to a London hospital because no one could help her. If he hadn't come over here, I wouldn't have been here. And how long did it take to start seeing her get better? She, she was better at the end of a year. Her symptoms had reversed, and in 1956, Dr. Walsh reported in the American Journal of Medicine that his drug discovery worked. Do you remember how you felt when you started to get better? Yeah, I was walking, I was doing everything. How did that feel to be able to walk again? It felt lovely. Dr. Walsh continued his research in Cambridge and found that Wilson disease needs to be treated every day for life. The results of his drug discovery were dramatic, but he also found that penicillin does not work for everyone. We ran into trouble with penicillin. I wanted an alternative treatment, and my laboratory was literally a couple of paces away from the university laboratory of biochemistry. And one morning I wandered over to the University of Biochemistry, ran into a biochemist called Hal Dixon. I explained my problem to him and he took a bottle off the shelf and said, triacetine tetramine, very similar to spiridine, should be non-toxic, uh, no, is known to bind copper, try it. And that's how we got triantine. So it was Hal Dixon's idea and my work proving that it worked and was safe. Do you feel like one is superior to the other? I think it's a question of which, which one works on best on which patient. I think it's a question of trial and error. Penicillamine and triantine turned Wilson disease from an always fatal disease to one that's treatable. Since then, researchers discovered that zinc works as a third treatment option. Shirley's taken penicillamine for 63 years. So what do you want other people with Wilson disease to know? Oh, to take it, take in the tablets. Please don't stop. She's been able to live a normal life. She married, and while raising her three children, she worked at Scotland Yard cleaning offices. You're a medical pioneer trying penicillamine but there's a lot of people better by taking it, it isn't there. How does that make you feel? Proud, happy. Dr. Walsh asked his patients to draw spirals to monitor their progress. Shirley keeps this London Times article that told the story of her remarkable recovery as a reminder of how far she's come since she drew her first spiral in 1955. What do you think, when you think about Dr. Walsh? He's marvelous. I wouldn't have been here but for him. Well, I think it is a remarkable series of coincidences that all worked out well. The coincidence that I discovered penicillin, which, which was a coincidental discovery, the discovery that we saw patients with Wilson's disease, and I realized that penicillin might work, and the coincidence that I was able to get some, and that it was able to show that it did work. And the whole thing was, you know, if all those coincidences hadn't worked out, the whole, the whole idea might have gone fat. It's incredible. Yeah, it was all good luck, really. Walking across that bridge and having that idea, I mean, where did that come from? Where did it come from? Someone up there. Where do ideas come from? Where do ideas come from? But the story doesn't end there. For too many people, getting the diagnosis and the life-saving medication in time, or at all, remains the challenge of Wilson disease.